Thirty years ago, this was my country, Germany, the place of my earliest and some of my fondest memories, holds also recollections of terror and great sadness. I am a former German, I am a Jew, and with this comes a difficult legacy, a heavy burden. The trip in 1969 was an academic trip, but it was also an intensely personal trip for my father. It was his chance to journey back to his homeland in northern Germany for the first time since he and his parents had escaped in 1939, literally days before the outbreak of World War II. He was a political science professor at Colorado College and went to Europe for a semester, both as a family sabbatical and to lecture across Germany on American foreign policy. He, he spoke in Munich, he spoke in Nuremberg, he spoke in, in a variety of places. He also sp um, spoke at the um, uh, equivalent of our West Point at the German Military Academy, uh, which was an interesting experience for him. When that trip was over, he wrote up that experience in an essay. That essay, now 40 years from when it was written, 30 years from when he passed away, strikes me as equally relevant today. I grew up in a very small town called Horde where my family had lived since at least the middle of the 18th century, and probably even before that. My father had a small store, men's and women's clothing, and the store occupied about half of the downstairs of the house in which we lived. It had been in my family for a long time. I think my grandfather was born in it, and that must have been in the 1850s. Just how long it was in the family before that is not known to me. I was an only child. Our household consisted of my parents and me and always a grandmother. But the extended family was large and very close. There were uncles, aunts and cousins who lived nearby and frequently came to visit. There had been a long history of Jews living in Horn, but by the 1930s, only five families were left in town. Ours was one of those families. I remember the day Hitler took power, January 30th, 1933. I also recall coming home from a school excursion to see people standing in front of our store. My dad had been forced to put a sign in the display window to the effect, don't buy from me, this is a Jewish store. My dad responded to the order by writing a letter of protest to the Nazi authorities. But his efforts were in vain and the business steadily declined. By 1936 and 1937, there were days when not a single customer entered the store. My mother thought we should stay put anyhow, that the madness could not last. My dad thought otherwise, and finally, in 1937, we left Horn. From our small town, my parents, grandmother and I went to Cologne, a large city where we could more easily hide our Jewish identity. My father could not get a job, and for two years we tried to emigrate from Germany. I remember that my dad made a trip to Italy 
and came back with a proposition to buy into a factory in Milan. When it became clear that half of our belongings would be confiscated by the German government if he went through with that project, the plan was abandoned. Another time, my father traveled to the Netherlands to see what business connections he might make there. But nothing came of it except a plan to send me to Holland so that I would be safely out of Germany. In retrospect, of course, I have much reason to be grateful that the project failed. All my relatives who had moved to Holland were overtaken by the German invasion of 1940 and eventually transported to extermination camps where they were killed. Surely this would also have happened to me had I gone there. Back in Germany, anti-Jewish rhetoric continued to escalate. My father decided that Germany had become too dangerous for us to stay there any longer. Having made a plan to emigrate to the United States, Dad got a friend in Holland to put up $10,000 as a guarantee that we would not be a burden on the public there. Even so, it was a slow process because the American quota of some 35,000 German immigrants per year was heavily oversubscribed with Jews trying to leave. I remember waiting interminably in long lines to be questioned and examined. Finally, they gave visas to my parents and me to travel to the United States. We then purchased tickets to sail from Hamburg on the USS Manhattan in early September. August 1939, the month before we were scheduled to leave for the United States, was a nervous month with ever-increasing warlike gestures on the part of the Nazi government. When the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact was announced, it came like a bombshell, and the meaning was perfectly clear. War was imminent. At that time, my dad decided that the risk was too great for us to wait, that no American ship was likely to come to Hamburg in early September anymore. We went downtown to the Belgian and French consulates, both of which were already closed. But he managed to rouse someone in each place to secure new transit visas so that we could leave Germany immediately. And on the afternoon of August 26th, while the Packers were still in the house, we took our suitcases and took the streetcar to the main railroad station to board an agonizingly slow train to the border. At the border, we had to change trains. And while we waited for the one to take us out of Germany, an SS man in his black uniform came to inquire about our mission. He had all of us thoroughly examined and had my dad confined for the better part of an hour, an hour when, in a sense, everything hung in the balance. Dad finally reappeared. He never said what had transpired. At last, we were on the train and across the Belgian border, which was sealed soon after our train had crossed it. Safely out of Germany, I remember thinking about my grandmother, who remained in Cologne. She had intended to emigrate with us, but had to be left behind because the $10,000 guarantee to the American government was insufficient. So my grandmother stayed and suffered the same fate as every other member of my family who didn't get out. Leaving without Oma Mater was a hard decision to make. I remember a few years after leaving Germany, opening the last letter from my grandmother in which she wrote of her impending deportation east. My mother never quite got over it. We 
We were on the high seas, somewhere southwest of Ireland, when war was declared. August 1939 was the last time my father saw Europe until he returned with us 30 years later in August of 69. I had been away from Horn for 32 years, and it was a strange sensation to now drive back into it. I drove right to the Markplatz, the central square, parked the car and got out, and stood in front of our house. It was very much as it had been 32 years ago, and I just stood looking at it for a long while. I think I walked every inch through the streets of the old city, remembering that a friend used to live here, and a certain shop used to be located there. I saw very many people whom I had known as a child. I met former friends, now in their forties, like myself, with whom I had gone to school, with whom I had played until they could no longer afford to be seen together with me and had to drop the relationship. Grundschülerin habe ich ihn kennengelernt, gemeinsame Klassenkameraden. Ja, es war äh, eine herzliche äh, Verbindung ohne Probleme. Aber ich bin dann noch äh, heimlich, wenn es dunkel war, äh, hin, äh, wieder nach Hause gegangen. Also äh, habe mich vor Kritik gefürchtet, mhm. ja? äh, dass, dass ich mit Juden verkehre. Mhm. Ja, war Unrechtsbewusstsein habe hab ich auch meine Familie empfunden und, und auch viele äh, Freunde und, und Bekannte. Mhm. Sie das noch Ob, obwohl wir keinen äh, Protest eingelegt haben. Ich weiß auch nicht, wie der ankommen sollte, der Protest, das. Only one of my former friends explicitly asked me how I really felt back in those years, when all my friends, one after the other, had to drop me. He had often thought about it and wondered whether I had been able to forgive him and the others. What he explicated, however, was something which I felt was implicit in the other relationships as well. It was good that my old friends had thought about what had happened and considered it from my perspective. For my part, I recognize that children can be thoughtless and cruel all on their own, of course, but in this case, I do not see how they really had adequate defenses against a system that prescribed certain behaviors to them. I had been afraid of the return visit to Horn, but the people whom I met reminded me, on the whole, of pleasanter parts of my youth. I had long wondered what my friends in Horn thought about those times and about what had happened to their Jewish neighbors. The week we spent in Horn, and as importantly, the months spent in Germany, answered these and other questions. 
I discovered that the history of the 1930s is remembered in Germany. Whether it be a report on trials of suspected concentration camp guards, or the dedication of a memorial stone where the old synagogue stood, I am happy to see that there does not seem to be a conspiracy of silence to relegate that dark chapter of Germany's recent past to a deep and dark, unknown and undiscussed theme. The memory of the war years and of the Hitler period is fresh, even though many, perhaps most, adult Germans are not old enough to have actively participated in those events themselves. This was particularly apparent to me when my two sons and I visited the Dachau concentration camp one day in October. As we approached the camp, I felt a terrible reluctance to go through with the visit, and then felt ashamed of myself for being afraid to go in under the conditions in which I found myself. When so many people had no choice, and must have known that they would never come out alive. It is quite impossible today to recapture the horror which it must once have been. A sample cell block still stands. The others are torn down and only their foundations are outlined. The large square in front of the compound now dominated by an immense sculpture of men caught in barbed wire, is where the prisoners were assembled, and often some executed in the sight of their fellow prisoners. The crematorium also still stands, and it took a great effort to force myself to enter it. It is surrounded by mass graves, now beautifully landscaped. The contrast of the camp's peaceful natural setting with its historic brutality is strange and unsettling. So too the lovely historic town of Dachau, just a few miles from the camp gates, seems at odds with its history. The citizens of Dachau try very hard to erase the association of their city with this monstrous institution, or, if not to erase it, to superimpose another image upon it. I can understand their desire to disassociate themselves from the name of the camp but I'm afraid it won't work for them any more than for the citizens of Sachsenhausen, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, or other localities whose names will forever be associated with blots on the human record. I think that our visit to Dachau, painful as it was, was an important part of our trip. It helped my children to understand the ambivalence of my feelings towards the country and the society from which I came and to which I had now temporarily returned. I found that, for me at least, there was no ambiguity at all about my own position upon this return visit. I was, in every respect, not just legally, but more importantly, psychologically, a foreigner. I was moved when I visited the cemeteries where my paternal grandparents, my maternal grandfather, and many other members of my family were buried, especially since I would perhaps be the last person from my family to ever visit there.
I had feelings when I visited the spot in the city of Detmold, on which had once stood the synagogue in which I had my bar mitzvah in 1936. Like all other synagogues, it was destroyed in the crystal night of 1938. At the site, a plaque is inscribed with a quotation from the prophet Malachi, which had once been inscribed over the front door of the old building. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then do we deal treacherously, brother against brother, and destroy the bond which God has created? But in spite of these personal moments, I was clearly an outsider, clearly a different person than when I had left. And I think this situation gives me some of the detachment which is necessary to address the enormously difficult question of a Jew's attitude toward Germany today, 30 years later. I am sure that every one of us must answer that question for himself. My answer, forged out of experiences of the last several months, is something like this. I cannot forget what happened. The record is too enormous to allow such an easy escape. Nor can I forgive. Very many members of my own and my wife's families, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, as well as many good friends, were the victims of the greatest organized crime wave in all recorded history. The deeds were so incredible, of such non-human scale, that human forgiveness is both impossible and, in a sense, irrelevant. But I can, I think, do some other things which place both the question of forgetting and forgiving in a different context than if they occupied the center of my concerns. In the first place, I can remember that many non-Jewish Germans also suffered at the hands of the Nazis. Proportionately, to be sure, Jews endured more than others. But Dachau contained as many or more non-Jews as Jews. I can recognize that the devastating destruction of property and more importantly of life and health was a price the Germans, Nazis and non-Nazis alike, had to pay. I don't know how one figures a calculus of death and injury when each single case hits those affected with a total impact. But I think we need to remind ourselves of something that during and after the war I had tended to overlook. The Germans paid a heavy price for the misdeeds of their government, their society, themselves. We can at least be conscious of this fact. Secondly, it is important to make distinctions among Germans, however difficult it is to do this. A number of them fought courageously against the regime, with incredible odds against them, and usually with fatal consequences. A larger number of Germans were appalled, but felt helpless. Some collaborated with the regime in some respects, but opposed it in others. And some, of course, were wholeheartedly in support of what was done. It is no longer easy, and it may not even any longer be possible, to disentangle exactly who did what and why in those years. But surely, for instance, the young generation, now in their twenties and thirties, cannot be burdened with whatever guilt their parents must carry. And then it seems to me that Jews, of all people, 
should reject the notion that all Germans are the same. This is precisely what the Nazis did to them. No one should be more ready and able than Jews to see through the practice of ascribing individual characteristics to whole groups, because Jews have for so long been on the receiving end of precisely this practice, and with devastating consequences. And finally, I think that in shaping my attitude to the Germans, I can now go beyond the categories of forgiving or forgetting and attempt to go on from where we are, not where we and the Germans were a generation ago, transcend, as it were, the past and look toward the future. I know that there are extremist elements in Germany which worry me, just as there are in this country where, at the moment, they worry me even more. But I also feel that the traumatic experience through which the Germans have come has given a better chance than ever before for creating a more decent, humane, just and sensitive society. It is an act of self-interest and also one of justice and charity to encourage those elements in the German society which are moving toward such a future, to give them the kind of understanding and support which is all the more meaningful because it is grounded in the transcending of a tragic experience.